Jacob. I am love. I am jealous, forgiving, and sovereign. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am Jehovah, Yahweh, Adonai. I am the Great Shepherd. I am. Good morning, Mountain View. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good? Good? Yeah. Um, for those of you, oh, well, welcome to uh, live stream. I always forget to do that. But uh, welcome to anybody who's joining us on live stream as well. Um, this is not a normal Sunday for me. Um, normally, if you know, if you've been here or if this is your first time, then uh, I am, my name's Cody. I'm the worship pastor here. Um, and uh, this is a, definitely a different perspective. Uh, normally, I'm where Nate was this morning leading worship, but it, now I'm, well, I guess, sitting here. I'm not really standing, but uh, sitting here in front of you giving the message. So this is definitely a different perspective for me, and I just hope that Lee and I can give you guys a different perspective this morning on some scriptures that we've been going through about God's intentional and unconditional love um, over the past couple weeks. And I'm Lee Shiflett. Uh, I'm blessed to be a part of the worship team with Cody as one of the drummers, uh, but I'm also an elder here at Mountain View, so by default, I'm Elder Lee. <laughs> I've been asked for the last 15, 16 months uh, since I became an elder when I would be speaking, and what I've told people is behind that drum set, I feel safe. It's my little space. I feel comfortable. This, not so much, but... I appreciate the opportunity, and I definitely uh, feel the blessing that it's been to, to dig into this with Cody. So with that, God loves you. He loves you. <laughs> I feel like we could stop right there and probably go home. It's a pretty rich statement, right? God loves you. God loves me. God loves us. We say it often. I know I do. And I believe there's a right time to say that. But there's also, I believe, a wrong time to say that. And we can use it somewhat flippantly. Let me give you a quick story. How many here are familiar with the CIA first responders training? All right, some of you. For those who are not, uh, Christ in Action does a two-day seminar, which basically equips you to be a first responder in a sense that you can help minister to people who are going through times of crisis. Um, it could be a natural disaster, uh, a death in the family, uh, any number of things that people go through that are traumatic. So they equip you with these tools, and then they put you into these scenarios to practice these tools. So the gentleman that I got paired up with uh, the last day, he drew a scenario. I had no idea what that scenario was, and my responsibility was to figure out what the scenario was and then minister to them using, again, these tools that CIA had given us. So the minute that the scenario starts, this gentleman just went completely blank and then tears started flowing. So either he had experienced this type of scenario in his life or he was just a really good actor. But I was completely put on my heels by this. So I start going through the tools and, and the training that I've been given over the past 48 hours and I'm striking out and I'm struggling and I'm just clawing to try to make some kind of inroads with this gentleman through his tears. Finally, almost had a desperation. I just threw out, God loves you. And he looked at me and said, well, if God loves me, then where was he when this happened? If God loved this person, then why did it happen to this person? And I was like a deer in the headlights. Thank goodness the buzzer went off and that scenario ended. <laughs> and I was very relieved because I realized that I had try to use a statement that we use very often, which has a lot of truth that we believe to be very true as believers in Jesus Christ, that God loves us. But I definitely used it in the wrong way. I used it as, for lack of a better term, almost a crutch, hoping that it would make it all better. But made it worse. So yeah, God loves us. God loves you and he loves me. But what does that really mean? Yeah. Um... Thinking on the, on the flip side of things, a very similar phrase, uh, God is love, 
I think is also used kind of out of context a lot of the times. Uh, we may hear that phrase, God is love, or God loves us, or God loves you um, from, from believers, but we can also hear those things from non-believers as well. And, and a lot of the times I feel um, like when, when a non-believer, or even when we use that phrase, God is love, out of context or to misinterpret it almost, is uh, it's used in a way to almost justify what we're doing justify our actions or justify our sins um, or, or just to live out of complete disobedience of who God is knowing that he is loving and so ultimately he will forgive us. But really that's, that's not how it works. Um, ultimately this, this phrase God is love um, it, it should point back to the character of who God is. It ultimately should exalt him. And I've caught myself actually knowing, okay, well, I don't know if this is the right thing to do, but I know that his mercies are new the next day, so I'll probably be okay, right? But that's, we shouldn't have that kind of mentality when we, when we look at the character of who God is and his love. And, you know, if we as believers struggle in that way as well, it's definitely, absolutely, the case for uh, non-believers in some cases. Absolutely. So we talk about the intentional, the unconditional love of God. But as believers, how can we understand that better? And to understand that better means that we can portray it better in our lives. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, convey that intentional, unconditional love of Jesus Christ to others who don't believe. So... In my own study time in the last few months, I've really gotten into uh, looking in the words uh, and what those words actually mean. More specific, uh, the Greek in the New Testament, the Hebrew in the Old Testament. You know, why was a particular word used the way that it was? What did it actually mean? And, and that even translates over to English. You know, why do we use certain words in the English language? Intentional. So when you hear the word intentional, what are some other words that come to mind? On purpose. Deliberate. Willingly. Willingly. These are all great. These are all on my sheet, so fantastic. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> uh, some other synonyms. Calculated. Premeditated. We heard voluntary. Willful. Designed. Uh, meant. Prearranged. Purposed. Deliberate. These are all words that come to mind when you start digging into intentional. Yeah. What about unconditional? What are some words that come to mind when you hear the word unconditional? No strings attached. No strings attached. Without limits. What was that? Without limits. Without limits. Mm -hmm. Forever. Forever. Yeah, these are all great as well. And some other synonyms would include absolute, wholehearted, unqualified, unreserved, unlimited, unrestricted, or unquestioning. Unconditional. You know, the more that I looked at this word, and as we were even putting this sermon together, the more that I realized I had almost become numb to this word and the phrase, unconditional love of God. It's almost like one of those Christianese phrases that we often hear, you know, oh, you've been redeemed, you've been saved, or God bless you. Bless your heart. And bless your heart, you know, <laughs> this unconditional love of God. And I was really struggling because... I feel like a lot of the times I don't actually either realize the depth of that statement or I don't actually believe that I deserve it. And that's, it's so important to know and kind of dig into what the unconditional love of God really is. And so as we focus on the characteristic of the love of our God today, um, it's really important for us to understand what this love is and what it means to us. So we're going to jump into some scripture right now. Um, so you can open your Bibles, tablets, phones. If you have a parchment, just find the one that's labeled First John. Uh, we're going to jump around a little bit too. And if you can't keep up, we're going to have it behind us on the screen. Um, so the first letter of John, not the gospel, the letter, um, there's been some scholarly debate about who the intended audience of this letter was and what the true purpose of this letter was. Um, what we can look at, regardless of who the uh, audience and the recipients were supposed to be, we can see some very consistent themes, and that is 
John is doing something very intentional in this letter, and that is calling out the appropriate truths of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Uh, what scholars are, are thinking he's trying to get to the point here is that there's a lot of false doctrine that's being brought up in the early church, and he's doing his best to refute that. So we go over to 1 John chapter 4, starting at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. There's a lot of love in that verse, right? We'll go back to Romans 5 in Paul's writing. But God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we're all familiar with John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now as we read through these different scriptures, uh, different authors we see a common thread. And that common thread is God's not just telling us that he loves us. He's showing us by doing something that requires a very intentional act. In 1 John 4, he sent his son for us. In Romans 5, he, I'm sorry, in John 3, 16, he gave his son for us. And in Romans 5, we see that he sent and gave his son to demonstrate his love by dying on the cross. So in these verses, God has intentionally taken some actions to show that love for us, but to what purpose? Now, as we start to peel back some of these layers about intentional and unconditional love of God, we can also start to figure out what that love doesn't look like and what it isn't represented by. And first off is God's love is never without purpose. Uh, second, God's love is not involuntary. And God's love is not unintentional. So we looked at some other words that are synonyms for intentional and unconditional a little while ago. So what would be some opposite words to those? So for unconditional, we have words like doubtful, equivocal, questionable, restricted, uncertain. Intentional, some of the opposite words would be involuntary, unwilling, accidental, unintentional unplanned. Now, I don't know about you guys, but none of these words sound representative of the God that I know, love, and serve. I don't serve a God who's unwilling. I don't serve a God who is uncertain. And I don't serve a God who's unintentional. And think about that. Have you ever loved something unintentionally? I mean, is that even possible? We love someone or something, and there's typically a purpose behind it, we're expecting some kind of uh, feeling or response in return. And the way we convey that love is typically based on what our desired outcome is of that. So I love my wife, Jessica. She's right over there. <laughs> <laughs> I love my kids. I love playing the drums. And I love coffee. And I, I love eating seafood. No. I've said I love each one of these things, but no one in this room believes for a second that the way I love these people and these things are by any sense the same. The way I love my wife and love eating of seafood are obviously completely different. To dig into that just a little bit better, we have a short video that we wanted to show you. A young man, why are you eating that fish? And the young man says, because I love fish. He says, oh. You love the fish. That's why you took it out of the water and killed it and boiled it. He said, don't tell me you love the fish. You love yourself. And because the fish tastes good to you, therefore, you took it out of the water and killed it and boiled it. So much of what is love, right, is fish love, right? And so, young couple falls in love. Young man and young woman fall in love. What does that mean? That means that he saw in this woman, someone who he felt could provide him with all of his physical and emotional needs. And she felt in this man, somebody she feels that she can write, that was love, right? But each one is looking out for their own needs. 
it's not love for the other. The other person becomes a vehicle for, for my gratification. Too much of what is called love is fish love. Right? An external love is not on what I'm going to get, but what I'm going to give. We had an ethicist, Rabbi Dessler, who said, the people make a serious mistake in thinking that you give to those whom you love. And the answer is, the real answer is, you love those to whom you give. And his point is, if I give something to you, I've invested myself in you. Right? And since self-love is a given, everybody loves themselves, now that part of me has become in you, right, there's part of me in you that I love. Right? So true love is a love of giving, not a love of receiving. So here we are. We've kind of discussed the intentionality of God's love, but I really want to hit more on this unconditional aspect. And uh, we just heard in that video that true love is a love of giving, not a love of receiving. And I really think he captured that idea perfectly when he said that people make a serious mistake in thinking that you give to those whom you love. When the answer is, the real answer is, you love those to whom you give. And when I first saw this video, the, the, the verse that came to mind was one that we mentioned earlier, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he what? That he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God has given his son to us. And, it, and in that video he said, um, when I give something to you, I have invested myself in you. And... That kind of really hit me because you think on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes and indwells in the believers, now we actually have a part of God in us, indwelling in us. So that's how God can see us, see me as righteous, how he can see me as holy, how he can look at me and see his son because we now have the Holy Spirit indwelt in us because for God so loved the world that he gave his son that's that unconditional love. That's that unconditional, calculated, intentional love of God. And so true love is a love of giving, not a love of receiving. And so I want to break it down a little bit more. We'll go back to uh, a couple scriptures here in a second. But when, I was, when we were doing this study and, and kind of breaking the words down in the word study, you see in the Greek that there are four words for love. And this is just four, love, four words of love in the Greek language total. You have eros, storge, phileo, and agape. I'm only going to be focusing on two today because those are the only two that are actually used in the New Testament. You have phileo, which is brotherly love, which is where you get Phil, the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And then you have agape, um, which is unconditional, um, committed, faithful, willful, and perfect love from God. And so looking at the scriptures, we see in John 15, 12 through 17, it says, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of my Father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. And then we continue to see in Matthew 22, 37 through 40, when Jesus was actually being questioned by the Sadducees at this point, he's asked, what is the greatest commandment? And his response reiterates the same idea. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These, on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So in both of these scriptures, Jesus is really calling us to not only love God, but also to love others in a very intentional and unconditional way. Because as we look at it and, and broke it down in the Greek, the word that's used for love in both of these scriptures is actually agape. So if you, if you think about it, 
we are called to not only unconditionally and intentionally love God and extend that love back to God, the one who first gave it to us, but we're called to also extend and give that agape love to those that are around us intentionally and unconditionally. As it says in John 13, 35, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That again is that agape love. If you extend this agape love to one another, then they will know, those looking on from the outside, they will know that you are my disciples. So we're called to intentionally and unconditionally love God and love others, to show this agape love um, to God and to others. As I said in John 15, um, to love one another just as I've loved you. And in John 13, it says, um, you will be known as his, as his disciples by showing the agape love for one another. In previous scriptures that we looked at earlier, in 1 John 4, John 3, 16, uh, Romans 5, 8, the word used there for love, as well as always agape. And something came to me yesterday as I was looking back over my notes, going back to word studies is, what does beloved mean in these scriptures? Well, the word that is used for beloved is agapetos. And there's only two applications for this word in the New Testament. One of them is when Christ is actually referred to as beloved by the Father. So it's a reference to the Messiah, to Christ. And it's used in describing and welcoming uh, other believers. That is in this letter. So here's a couple questions for you. Can a non-believer know and show agape love to others? If we're only capable of showing that love because we've experienced it, is it possible for a non-believer to do that? When a person says, God is love, are they speaking as one who has experienced agape love? When we say, God loves you, are we speaking to share this agape love? Going back to my example, I can tell you right now, no. I know I wasn't. And how do I convey agape love, a love that is not about me, to a culture that is all about self? To say God loves you, God loves me, and God loves us, we have to understand this love is unconditional. Yeah, and on the flip side, to say that God is love and to say that agape, uh, God is agape, we have to understand that his love is also intentional. As I was kind of going through this, this study with Lee together, and we were kind of putting this sermon, um, putting all the pieces together, I, I had to look closer at the word unconditional. Um, and I wanted to look at the prefix un, because I wanted to make sure that my mind was on the right track in, in the way that this word is put together. And uh, when I looked it up, I got this. Um, if you can't read it all the way in the back, that's fine. It says it's an informal dialect. It's a pronoun, um, one. And the example is a gooden. <laughs> now, that works here in Virginia, but... Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't know how well that technically works for... It's not really what I was looking for either. I was like, what the heck? But, uh, but the more that I thought about it and the more that I processed it, the more that I realized that it, God's love really could be seen as one conditional. And why? Well, if we, if we look at Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 14, it says, If you declare with your mouth... Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentiles. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Ultimately, when you think about it, this one conditional or unconditional love of God, the only condition is that you accept it. And the only condition is that you believe with your, with your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ was raised by the power of God from the dead and that he now lives and reigns in heaven with the Father. But the intentional, unconditional love of God is not him allowing us to live how we want. 
And it's certainly not him removing himself to just live how he please without consideration of, of his commandments. It's not agape love. We oversimplify God's love. I know I do. And when we start talking about it, sometimes we'll try to use uh, an example that kind of brings it into focus. One of the ones that I know I've heard and maybe even used is you, you think about a parent. They don't want their, their child to, to burn their hand on a hot stove, so you obviously pull that child back. You know, it's, I, I don't want him to hurt himself. But God did not come and die on the cross to convey an agape love to save us from some temporal pain. He did it to save us from burning in hell forever. He didn't come and hang in all his discomforts so that we would have no discomfort in his life. He didn't come and suffer the cross so we could live a safe, comfortable, temporary life. He did this to call us, call us to a higher standard of living. He didn't do it to excuse our sins. He did it to release us from bondage. And to what purpose? For his glory. Bottom line. So as believers, we're supposed to display and convey and portray and show this agape love to everybody. So what will that do? What is that supposed to do? If we're truly showing agape love, what is the response? It's going to point it back to him. It has to. God's intentional love towards us is unconditional. Yeah, God's unconditional love for us is intentional. And when we experience this agape, we have to be intentional and unconditional in our love for God and also our love for others. As it says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Well, these commandments that is, is being referenced here um, or are being referenced here um, is the commandments that Jesus said to love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and love your neighbors as yourself. Those are the two commandments. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So ultimately, if we love God, and love others, show this agape love to God, and show this agape love to others, we are keeping those commandments. But we are only capable of showing this agape love because he first showed it to us. As it says in 1 John 4.19, we love because he first loved us. We agape because he first showed us that agape. That's exactly what it says in the Greek. If you go back again and look at the, look at the Greek, it says it uses agape both times. We can experience and show this agape because he first gave and extended that kind of love to us. Back in uh, a little bit farther in, in 1 John 4 again, we looked at verses 7 through 10, and this won't be on the screen, but I saw this uh, just this morning um, in verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Agapetos, if God so agape us, we also agape one another. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So if we're only capable of experiencing and showing agape love because of what Christ did, then that agape love will have to point back to him. Mm -hmm. Our intentional, unconditional love is only possible if that love leads us to point others back towards Christ. Yeah. So to kind of wrap it all together um, here at the end, we, we've been talking about this agape love, and I feel like we've been, we've been using that word a lot, agape. It kind of gets all jumbled up and whatnot. <laughs> but agape love from God is perfect, bottom line. Agape love from God is perfect. Now, agape love shown through us is only perfect if it has a perfect focus. That perfect God, the perfect love that was first extended to us from God, our agape love to others has to have that perfect focus of God. And so, ultimately, as Lee and I were putting this sermon together, we, we came up with this question. Um, and it's a fill in the blank, so it should be um, somewhat, somewhat easy. <laughs> uh, God's unconditional, intentional love will require me to unconditionally and intentionally what? <laughs> Let me say it again. 
God's unconditional, intentional love will require me to unconditionally and intentionally what? <laughs> you want to take that? <laughs> First service did the exact same thing, and I'm not saying it's wrong. It absolutely is calling us to love others. Mm -hmm. And that may be exactly what you need to fill in that blank. When Cody and I first started digging into this, this was one of the first things we actually put on paper and said, this is, this is what we're getting to. This is, our, this is our driving point. This is where we're trying to get with this message, is how do we exercise and how do we convey that agape love? Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is, is the minute that I saw that on paper, I was able to fill it in like that. And it was, we had only a fraction of what we were able to give to you today through this. And I filled it in, and I looked at that, and it struck me, and I realized that through my entire life, I've grown up in churches, and I've heard agape thrown around a lot. Most of us probably have. But I still, even after this study, still don't fully comprehend what that means. So that is a challenge for us today. What does that fill in the blank? Is that agape love you answering a call to teach or a call to missionary work or a call to ministry? Agape love to others is giving of your time, your talent, your treasure. Is agape love forgiving someone that you held on to for a long time? It's not a simple statement. And it's not easy and we're going to fail. Because I know I fail at this all the time. And we're able to show that agape love because he first showed us. You want to know how difficult it was to show agape love? That's how difficult it is. And he showed us so that we wouldn't have to do that but called us to a higher purpose as believers to show that agape love to others. And maybe for you, that blank today is surrender because maybe you haven't experienced that agape love. I'm up here. Cody's here. We got plenty of leaders in this building. If you have not experienced that agape love, fill in that blank today and surrender. Talk to me. Talk to Cody. Talk to anybody else. Experience that agape love for the first time. Yeah, let's pray together. God, thank you um, for showing us what true love really is. Lord, help us to not only love you in a manner that reflects that agape love, but also to help us to love others in the same way. Lord, whatever that looks like in our lives, Lord, I just ask that you can reveal that to us this morning. Whether that is forgiveness, whether it might be asking forgiveness, Lord, even if that is surrendering our lives over to you, God, Help us to be intentional and unconditional in the way that we not only love you, but love those around us. Lord, you are good, you're holy, and we praise you for all the things you have done and will do. In Jesus' name, amen.